Well, friends, we've had a, a really good experience of keeping on time through these few days. So we will continue with it, and we will certainly finish on time. There are trains and planes and other things to be caught. Uh, so my name is Brian Trench. Uh, I'm the chair of the PCST External Relations Committee, and it's in that capacity uh, that I invited people from the three associations with which we have cooperation agreements to join us here and reflect on our conference, which they've attended, uh, and to tell us a bit about what their conferences look like and what their associations are doing. And we'll discuss collaboration uh, across the associations and uh, across the communities uh, in more general terms also. But we will keep to the clock and there are various things to be done in the wrap up uh, at the very end. So Heather Doran, Secretary of PCST, will make sure to say when we're to stop and uh, we then have, we'll hear something about the next conference and the one after that and a few other things that Jenny, uh, president of the uh, network, will tell us about. Okay, so here we have Sissi Asqual, who is the Secretary General at Wetenskap uh, and Almenhet in Sweden. She liked it, she liked it, uh, science and public. Uh, but more, for today's uh, purpose, she is the president of the European Science Engagement Association, known in brief as UC. We have Anka Vonneberger, an associate professor in Amsterdam School of Communication Research, representing the International Environmental Communication Association. And we have Miguel Garcia Guerrero, who is a science museum curator uh, in the Autonomous University of Zacatecas in Mexico. He's representing REDPOP, the Latin American Science Communication Network. So, as I say, those are three associations with which, with which PCST Network has uh, somewhat formal arrangements. Uh, and we are open to and probably thinking about uh, establishing similar arrangements with other associations. So, to start, I'm going to ask you... Oh, sorry, I should explain that one of the focus or foci that we had planned for this last session was the proposed international year of, sorry, I'm sitting with my back to some, uh, the proposed international year of science engagement in 2027. Uh, and we were to have had somebody to represent that in the panel. Uh, in recent weeks, Falling Walls in Berlin, which was coordinating that, that project, indicated that they couldn't continue to do that and they're about to tell us today uh, that it's off the agenda, which is unfortunate, but maybe it's a kind of interesting point to reflect on, you know, in terms of the difficulties of doing things on a global scale. So we might come back to that. Um, so hence the absence of somebody whom you may see in the program. So I'm gonna ask you just one each to give your observations on the conference that you've been attending for one, two, or three, or even possibly four days, uh, and to situate your observations in the way that you do things in your organizations or in your communities. Sissy, would you start, please? Yes, thank you. It's been an amazing conference, don't you think? Uh, I've been here for, for three days, not for the, the Tuesday, but the rest of the conference. Um, I think it's always about networking. It's always about meeting new people, learn new things, hopefully also to share some experience you gained back home. So I think uh, PCSD, as well as UC, as I'm representing also, uh, it's mainly about meeting people, relating to people, learning from people, and conference, the annual conference, a biannual conference, if it, um, when you're talking about PCSD, that's really where we all gather. That's the highlight, of, that's why we are members of the organization. So, uh, and I can, say a lot about highlights I had, but it's really about encounters and especially those interactive sessions. I try to pick those ones to go to workshops, to go to things where we really can interact because we talk a lot about the importance of dialogue and the importance of co-creating things. But when it comes to conferences, not always. Uh, those sessions are so very interactive. So I try to pick and choose those. And have you, have you 
found it a dissatisfactory place to network? Has there been enough time and space to do the networking? Have you met people, new people, that you haven't, wouldn't have met otherwise, and so on? Uh, definitely, definitely, a lot of people. Um, what's special about PCST is about this global context. Usually we are in, uh, I am, in, in European, European settings, uh, interacting with people that are more, you know, in similar situations and in similar cultures. So what's very special about PCST is this, this very diverse meeting people from all over the globe, which also means that you learn a lot about that you can have very different um, opportunities, challenges compared to what we have in a high income country as Sweden is. Anke, uh, the International Environmental Communication Association has a perhaps very closely related, but nonetheless a very distinctly different uh, sphere of interest. Uh, you've been at their conferences, I presume, over the years. I mean, how, does, how, how do they compare? Yeah, so uh, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation and really nice to see so many faces here at the closing uh, plenary, which I think is uh, special and congrats to the organizers to getting uh, such a big crowd uh, together here uh, in, in Rotterdam. I came here today uh, kind of observing uh, a little bit. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the whole conference. And I put my environmental communication glasses on and made some observations. So I found some similarities, something that I think, oh yeah, that's really kind of uh, resonates also with our community. It's a lot about how the conference is set up so that there's a lot of room for practice, uh, but also that arts kind of play a role, that you have these uh, practice uh, sessions and workshops. Uh, but also teaching, uh, it's, a, it's a relevant issue that is discussed. So that's very similar also to uh, our conference, how we usually do it. Uh, obviously, there's uh, quite a bit of overlap uh, topic-wise uh, when it comes to the environment, right? Environmental issues, there are a lot of panels on climate change. But I also noticed that uh, you talk about a lot of more general challenges that we are also seeing or trying to tackle, think about misinformation and polarization, think about the quest for resilience or um, sustainability more generally, um, but also uh, that justice, social justice is increasingly uh, a topic that we are aware of and bringing in into all kinds of uh, discussions. And I also noticed some points that uh, we maybe can learn from you guys as community. Um, so I think we both share this um, aim for public engagement, increasing public engagement. And uh, what I saw here is that there's more um, talk also about impact and evaluation, which is something that uh, I kind of, I think it's a little bit lacking sometimes in environmental communication, um, but also that there's more room to think about participatory approaches, co-creation. I was on a panel on living labs, for instance, uh, which is really nice, which is something I think we can uh, explore further in environmental communication. Thank you, Anke. Uh, Miguel, uh, your organization is regional in the sense that it covers Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, what's the difference between that kind of uh, working in that kind of sphere and working in the global sphere? Well, first of all, I have to say that RedPop is more of a practice-led network. So most of our members are practitioners, although we also have researchers doing really important things. So uh, me, myself, coming for a really empirical approach at first, I was a child at a, at a science club 31 years ago, then became a volunteer practitioner when I was 15 years old, and then tried to go all the way through uh, to become a professional. And ever since my first experiences with uh, PCST Network, it, had was like, it was like an eye-opening experience getting to know all these people doing research, presenting new challenges, new perspectives on how I can see my own work and also how I can take experiences from all over the world to enrich what we, what we are doing. So we have a, a regional perspective on, on RedPop, but it's interesting to see people from all over the world who are facing the same challenges. Sometimes they have um, similar approaches, but sometimes they make us turn our perspective all the way around and see with fresh eyes and try to solve it with a new position. I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to learn from all the people here, to have all these uh, research experiences, outcomes. Uh, I have too much to digest in the following weeks from all of that, that I've seen at the, at the conference. And the only thing I regret is not personal, 
is it has to be a little bit of the structural constraints. I would like to see uh, a larger Latin American presence at the PCST conference because I know they can learn, uh, our peers from Latin America can learn a lot from people from all over the world. And also, I personally know of several, several really valuable experiences, efforts, initiatives for Latin America that they lack the enough resources to attend these kind of conferences. So that's why I think it's important for the rotation of the conference. We had one important in Salvador Bahia in 2014, but also it, it is great having the symposium, the, the opportunity for these regional uh, events that help connect uh, the larger global community of PCST researchers and practitioners with uh, these regional networks. And in a little while, we'll make uh, an invitation for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me, the, the conference has really reminded me of why it's so important to gather in person. Um, I was heavily involved with um, the virtual conference that was held during the pandemic. And I think gathering in person, I, I think it's allowed to everyone to pause a little bit between what they do day to day. And for me, it's really been about reflection based on what everyone has been saying at the sessions and really thinking about how I how I approach all the work that I do, both for PCST and in my, in my day job too. So I think that opportunity to stop what you do day to day and gather with people who are thinking about lots of, the, in some ways, similar things, but also very different approaches to how to do that makes you think about your own approach and reflect and consider then what we might do next when we leave here. Do you want to fire a question at them? I'll fire a question at them. Um, yeah, so I think maybe we've spoken a little bit, we've touched on a little bit some of the, the works that you do within your, within your networks, but I think it might be good for you to share just a few more words about what you all um, do within the networks that you're representing here. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, I'm representing them... Um, UC, which is European Science Engagement Association, so one of those European networks. And we are very much uh, for practitioners, um, but there are also some SciComm researchers and researchers interested in, in public engagement generally. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's a lot about conferences. Uh, so we gather annually, and I would like to take the opportunity to inviting you all to Bolzano in beautiful northern Italy in just like three weeks from now, uh, we will convene. I <laughs> know uh, it's <laughs> not the right timing maybe, but on the 3rd and 4th of uh, May. And uh, it's a lot about, like here, a lot of different sessions in parallel, a lot of workshops, a lot of short individual papers, so we call them horizon talks. Um, there will also be opportunities, of course, to to meet and greet, um, we will see Ötzi, you know, this uh, frozen uh, man uh, in the local museum. So it's, uh, we see ourselves much as a community of practitioners and it's kind of family-like, not uh, as big as here, maybe 100, 150 people are usually gathering. Apart from conferences, uh, we also meet virtually, as you do in the PCST. So we, we used to have what we call hot pots, you know, the, the Chinese uh, or Asian way of a gathering around a pot of something and you can all put your ingredients in and stir. And so this is a metaphor for that we can all add things and we, we really shape the meal or prepare the meal together and digest and usually also during lunchtime. So you can also have a sandwich and we're very happy to do such hot pots together with other organizations. We've done so with PCST. We've done so with the Berlin School of Public Engagement. So just get in touch. Uh, so those are the, the two main things we do. And I also would like to add that we try to gather a lot of resources useful for public engagement, like different formats, good reads, reports, etc which is gathered into what we call the European Science Engagement um, 
platform. Thank you. <laughs> that's it. I've been reading the literature. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So that's what we do. Thank you. Yes, thanks. So I'm here to represent the IECA, the International Environmental Communication Association. Uh, we are an organization that uh, kind of uh, yeah, promotes environmental communication on all kind of levels. Uh, so that's kind of uh, yeah, a lot of like-minded people coming together, although we come from very divergent uh, traditions, also research traditions. Uh, at the heart of our mission and identity is also that we are actually not an academic or solely academic association, but also an, acad an association for practitioners and artists. Uh, so this is also um, what is reflected, for instance, in our conference, which is kind of the biggest thing that we are doing biannually, COSI, the Conference on Communication and Environment. So here, another invitation in June. Uh, <laughs> you uh, may want to come to Harrisonburg in Virginia. Uh, there's the next uh, conference taking place. So this may also allude to one of the challenges that we have um, um, yeah, trying to uh, coordinate our different efforts as associations. Um, so at this conference, uh, we have academic presentations, but there are also other formats like workshops, but also uh, practice reflections, for instance, uh, a submission format or art, is, or art uh, submissions. So there's an exhibition, uh, typically, uh, sometimes also performances uh, going on, and it's kind of a nice mix, also a nice uh, atmosphere. It's not too big, around 200, uh, 300 people typically attending, so it's a bit of a smaller community compared to uh, PCTF. Uh, um, I see. I'm sorry. Do you know we really should look at our agreements together because they actually state that what we will do is avoid any clash of dates or any too close coming of dates. But of course, COVID threw out our schedule and probably affected your schedules. We're all playing catch up. Anyway, so that's, that's for another day and for another com another, another committee. I made I made a note on that. Indeed, yes. What's that? I made a note on that. So you make an, you made a note. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, but uh, besides that, we also, we do have a journal, Environmental Communication, you might know that, uh, but we also are there as a, as a network uh, for members to connect and also uh, we provide resources, uh, we offer courses, we are currently uh, putting a lot of effort in expanding our courses, so that might be another uh, aspect actually where collaboration uh, is something we can uh, start uh, thinking about. And there are kind of other benefits for members. So for instance, we have a Ringo status at the UNFCCC. So um, we're there at the COPS uh, as an observing organization and members can self-nominate to uh, take part and then uh, also get back to us and uh, reflect uh, with our members on uh, what's actually going on there. Yeah. Miguel. Well, Red Top is a Latin American network and the Caribbean for the popularization of science and technology. It was born in 1990 by an initiative of UNESCO, although we don't, we are not part of UNESCO, it just gave us a little push to, to start working. And uh, ever since then, it has uh, united uh, science museums, uh, university centers, science communication centers, interested in the advancement of science popularization in, in our region. We are, our main event is the Congress the, uh, that takes place every two years. Uh, we're expecting everybody who wants to join us in Rio de Janeiro in July this, this year, Fr from July 10th <laughs> to the Let's 16th. get this clear. We've got Rotterdam <laughs> in April, we've got Bolsano in May, we've got Virginia in June, and Rio in July. Okay, you got that in your diaries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an excellent opportunity for you to get closer to Red Pop. But we're also an action network. Uh, last year, uh, Red Pop got involved in the celebration of the International Day for Scientific Culture, which, is, which has activities on September 28th, commemorating the, uh, the first episode of Cosmos by Carl Sagan. That's why it was, uh, this date was, was chosen. It was a really interesting celebration. I invite all of you to join this year. It's still open if you want to participate. We have uh, 195 total institutions collaborating in 32 countries, not only in Latin America. We have presence in Europe, in A Asia, in Africa. I'm not sure if we have presence in Australia and New Zealand. So for our colleagues here, please join us in, in this celebration. It will be amazing to have more global participation on the International Day for Scientific Culture. 
And uh, we're also trying to build these bridges with other global associations. That's why we were lucky enough when we put a Zacatecas bid for a PCST symposium uh, that uh, Marta Cambre, who was then the director of RedPop, she supported the, the event. And in addition to being a PCST symposium, it, it has also the, the support of RedPop. We expect all of you to join us <laughs> next year <laughs> in Zacatecas. Zacatecas is in the middle north region of Mexico. Uh, the event will be held from April 10 to the 12th next year, almost one year from now. And we also pick the dates so you can attend a total solar eclipse that, <laughs> that will be, uh, in, in Zacatecas it will be only partially visible, but if we can take a three and a half hour drive, we can go to Torreón to watch the total solar eclipse. And also I might add that Torreón will have the central NASA broadcast uh, center for the eclipse. Uh, it's gonna be closed to the public, but the person responsible for this uh, collaboration with NASA was kind enough to say that all the PCST members who attend the eclipse will have full access to that center. So, so if you're not completely filled up with conferences at this stage, <laughs> there's yet more to come. I'll save a few, but actually there are other associations represented here. That is, there are people here who are members both of PCST and of other organizations. And one of them is the European uh, Association for Science Centers, Excite. Uh, Mairead Hurley, a board member. Can you tell us about when your conference is coming up? Oh. Excuse me, okay. It just gives us a sense of the character of the conference is different from this one. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, it's in Malta in June, and um, Excite Conference is the European S Association for Science Centers and Museums. So, it's more of a practitioner focus than this one, but we do also have researchers involved. There's probably more of the program focused on exhibitions and informal learning is quite heavily featured, but a lot of overlap with PCST and a lot of people here who attend both. So please join us in Malta this year. So the question obviously arises, you know, how come there are so many associations both with overlapping memberships and overlapping, overlapping purposes and overlapping interests? Is that unavoidable? Is that a historical accident? Is that something we should be seeking to do something about by way of merger, federation, or anything of that sort? I mean, you're, you're, you've been a regular attender of PCST, so why, why do we exist as two separate entities? I guess there's good reasons for all those networks uh, to exist in, in parallel. There are uh, similarities, but there are also some differences. And we started because there was a, a specific purpose that you wanted to network precisely with that group of people. And of course, there are uh, a lot of things we do have in common. And if you come to uh, a PCST conference or an Excite conference or a, a UC conference, where you can see uh, a lot of people are, are coming to, to all of them. Uh, but still, I think, as you say, the, the, the science museums, science centers, there's something specific about Excite. This, uh, uh, we used to be, uh, you see, uh, science event organizers of different kinds, like science festival arrangers. But now we see that it's more about public engagement, generally speaking, so that's what's reflected in our, our name. PCST, we have also the specifics that it's really both academics and practitioners, and I think that's a really good thing with the PCST conference. We already heard about your organizations, that there are similarities, but there are also differences. So I do think it's a good reason that there are many networks. That said, I do believe that we can do much more together and to create some common ground, if you like. Uh, and it's really good to... <laughs> I mean, when we, we do have uh, similar aims, it's really great to work together, but it's also good to have your specific community if you want to discuss things in a more nitty-gritty 
which are not relevant to all those networks. Michaela, can you manage, m imagine a common goal, a, 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 com a, a unifying project that the various associations here and maybe others might work together on? What, would, what might it be? Well, first of all, I think um, this kind of conference kind of addresses this common goal, which is complementarity. For example, I, I just told that Redpop is a more practitioner-oriented network, and PCSD is a really rich um, research network. We also have practitioners, but I think we really complement that way. But uh, coming, I, I do research myself now, but I have more of a practitioner background. I always mm, looking for action. So I, I think we, we might be able to find topics that call for action all over the world that can make us work together. And in my experience, when you reach the publics, when you try to engage them, and they feel not only that they're being listened to, that they are getting closer to science, but they are part of, of something bigger. It's really stimulating for them. We have programs in Mexico when they, we have uh, activities on the same weekend all over the country. And people get really excited about it because they are part of sub something bigger. So maybe w in addition to this kind of conferences or maybe setting some exchange programs to have larger opportunities to learn from each other, we might also have some special occasions, some special topics that lead us to action worldwide. We have one example with the International Day of Scientific Culture, but we might take vaccines of climate change, of new energies as topics that help us work together and get into action on a global scale. Well, before we go global, we'll be in Venice in September, 28th to the 30th of September. <laughs> um, before we go into orbit, actually, yeah. Uh, and you're going to hear about some other future events, the future conferences of PCST in a moment. So for the moment, thank you, Sisi. Thank you, Anke. Thank you, Miguel. Heather, would you pick it up? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is hand over to um, PCST um, President Jenny Metcalf, who's going to introduce um, a number of individuals who are curating the voice and doing some reflections on the conference. Can we put the slide up, please? Well, last session, last day. <sighs> I hope you've had as much fun as I've had. Um, today, in particular, I had the privilege of being involved in two workshop sessions, and we had so much fun. It was, um, it was really good. And the last session of the visual talks was very inspiring and interesting as well. So a really great last day. Um, there are five uh, people on stage who have been very busy over the last three days. Um, there have been, I believe, 162 parallel sessions you could have attended if you could have been in multiple places at the same time. <laughs> well, these five people did some of the work for you and they went to 60 sessions. And they've curated... Um, their view of what's happened under the acronym of VOICE. And you can see on the slide uh, what got lots of, what they think got lots of coverage and what didn't. So if you have a look, you can see that values is less, has been, seems to have got less of a conversation than say inclusion. And expertise has got rather more than openness. So perhaps we haven't covered each of these sub-themes in an equal way, but they're going to explain to us what they've uh, discovered um, in their journey through the conference, particularly focusing on these um, five elements of creating common ground. 
So our, our first person um, on my far right is Sika Jansma. He's from the University of Twente. And he particularly looked at values. So Sika, what did you discover? Yeah, and I should tell there were even more people who helped us with this. So we did not attend all the 60 sessions ourselves. That's oh, okay. almost <laughs> impossible, I think. <laughs> um, so we together, we analyzed these themes. And what we discovered about values is that there were really interesting reflections on the different values among different types of audiences on a cultural level, on a community level, and on an individual level. Furthermore, we also heard um, presentations and there were sessions that uh, elaborated on the different values between science communicators. So science journalism, they have different values than, for instance, people representing institutions. And then the third aspect, what we discovered is that there were talks about how values different, uh, differed among different types of scientists. Um, we heard talks about uh, different disciplines in science, but also even um, people who already work longer in science uh, uh, appear to have different values than people who just come into science, which I thought was a really interesting insight to hear. So, was there anything missing, or alternatively, what's the next, check, next step or the next challenge that we need to look at as a community? Yeah, well, we heard so many interesting reflections on how values differ among different groups, what I just explained. It would be really interesting to have a more critical reflection on what are those values then? So what are the different values among, for instance, the different types of audiences then, or different cultures, or the different scientists? So we would really love to hear more about that in two years, I think, at the next PCSD. So you want to know more about the differences in yeah. values? Okay. Yeah. How is that going to help create common ground? Yeah, I think if we know what are those different values, we might also uh, build bridges towards uh, each other, I think. And we uh, yeah, might learn better how the other party thinks and I think come together here. And I think we also had a really interesting uh, keynote speech about that uh, from Ulrike, who talked about valuing. And also, disagreement is not wrong, right? But understanding these disagreements, that might help us a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Sika. I'd like to turn to openness, and to help us with that is Yantine Shire. She's a practitioner, a science coordinator at the Lawrence Centre. Thank you very much, Yantine. Thank you. Yeah, so as you can see, openness was, well, was not as prominently discussed, although it was definitely there in sessions and it popped up in many sessions, but sometimes more of a, um, as a word. So for example, we, we saw that, yeah, of course, there was a lot of reference to this sort of um, yeah, grand challenge that we have or that, that we would like to solve, like opening up um, uh, the science system to, um, uh, broader audiences, to other voices, to other knowledge production systems. Um, and we really he heard quite a lot of talks uh, touching, touching upon that. Um, what we also particularly liked is that um, uh, we also heard people talk about um, uh, uh, yeah, opening up our own science communication um, uh, practices. So really reflecting on our own blind spots, um, and, um, well, maybe preconceived ideas and how those influence the way we shape our activities. So that was very nice to see. Um, and actually, I, I attended a lot of talks where we, uh, openness was really discussed on a human-to-human -human, uh, kind of level. So, um, uh, you know, in the sense of, yeah, uh, showing your humanness, um, uh, showing that you are a person also as a scientist. So, you know, really daring to be vulnerable because, because then people, it helps people to trust you uh, and to connect to you. Um, so that was very beautiful to see. And what we actually did not see that much was like this talk about sort of this, this open access part that you usually hear a lot about in, when you talk about open science or responsible research and innovation, which openness is also a theme. So, um, yeah, that was not as prominently there. So as we go forward, what does our community need to be thinking about when we look at openness in our conversations? 
Yeah, so I was, I was thinking about that. So personally, <laughs> I think it would be, so I think we, also, we talk a lot about our practices and, 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 and the, th the things that we do, and that's of course also logical because um, yeah, many of us are also practitioners, so you, you think of your own practices, but I think we should also really look at the systemic level and the kinds of barriers that we need to overcome at that level to, th that will allow us to open up our practices more. So I think that would be, um, yeah, I think that would be an important uh, uh, yeah, level that we should not be ignoring uh, because we are influenced by these systemic factors. So systemic barriers, are we talking institutional? Are we talking government? Are we talking barriers that are actually within us ourselves? I think all of those. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the third person is probably not new to you if you went to the plenary or the dinner last night. He showed us he can do more than uh, just um, <laughs> do rap. Um, John Chase, you looked at inclusiveness. Um, what was it that really struck you about this discussion? And this was possibly the biggest discussion of the conference, according to your, your graph. Yeah, so, so inclusiveness, inclusion, inclusivity, uh, the main thing was like how, for example, how to reach audiences. So people don't know how to reach audiences. And so it kind of goes into the area of inclusion, but it's not just about reaching them. It was about how to engage them. So how could it be more inclusive to engage more diverse groups and peoples? Um, and then it wasn't even just that. So not just reaching and engaging, but also hearing from and listening to. Um, allowing a way for people to be included in conversations and allowing their voice to be heard in conversation. And so um, there was some interesting thing I was looking at uh, youngsters and literally asking them, how do they want to be spoken to? How do they want to be included? And so a lot of it was listening to people and being inclusive in that way. Um, there was also quite a lot of focus on language, and language comes into a lot of things. There was language between different, uh, literally different countries, different peoples. Um, but then it's also the types of language you use. Is your language inclusive? Is it divisive? Um, is it demeaning, um, the words you use? Um, are these words that people want to be described with? Um, are these the words that should be the subject of conversations? And so language was also a feature. Um, and so many of the talks were about inclusion. And um, as this, this whole conference had a focus on boosting EDI generally amongst ourselves and amongst the things we talk about and in other ways. So it was kind of expected, I guess. Okay, so do you think that we are becoming more inclusive as a PCST community? Or what are the challenges we still need to tackle? All of them. <laughs> um, I'd like, I, I'd say, so it's good. We've like, so what struck me, I thought, this is brilliant. You've got people from everywhere. So clearly it feels people feel included or they've been included. But there's different reasons people are here. And even though people are here, it doesn't mean they represent the bulk of the communities they're from. Um, and like Sadat pointed out before, he said, I'm really privileged to be here. And in a way, anyone that's here potentially is quite privileged to be here. Um, more than the people you might look t to your left when you go back home. And so we've got a long way to go. We've got to look at who represents the scientific committee, who represents the members, where are we all coming from? Why aren't there more people that are putting themselves forward? Why aren't there more people that can attend? And this all comes towards inclusivity. And it's a big, big problem. It's not just something simple to solve. It comes down to education, infrastructure. But um, I think PCST can do a lot because it's a global network to try and really look at these things and see how we can marshal each other's experience and privilege to try and help others to achieve the status that, that many of us enjoy in our, in our societies. Thank you. We'll clap everyone soon. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce Eva Kalma. She is a scholar at Duff University. And she particularly looked at collaboration. And that didn't get a lot of airtime either, did it really, the collaboration? Um, I would argue with you. Uh, I've been to sessions and a lot of collaboration topics were, were covered. And to be honest, I tried to rank them from the absence of collaboration, which we heard also mentioned between practitioners and scientists. But also networking uh, was presented. There were lots of projects where uh, collaboration was happening uh, between scientists 
from different dis disciplines, or between scientists and journalists, scientific science communication practitioners, or with other people, other experts, mentioning musicians, uh, museum experts, curators, and so forth, creating together things like exhibitions or puppet shows, or even uh, really uh, exclusive science shows. And there were also projects which were mentioning co-creation, which is becoming a more buzzword, as we heard yesterday. Um, and also, we were able to do collaborative projects in the workshops. So I think it was a really wide palette of collaborative topics. So as we move forward in collaboration, and we heard of our partners in PCST uh, in the, the previous session, how can we collaborate even more proactively to reach that common ground? I think... Um, based on my observation, and it's really subjective, I have to say, uh, I think that there is a kind of parallel universes within PCST even. So those people who say that, okay, collaboration is between scientists, collaboration is between journalists and scientists. I think these communities within the community or the network are even not uh, communicating or working together. So I think there is a lot to do to, to understand each other's perspective and also um, reaching out to others who do things differently and who have completely different understanding of the same term of collaboration. I think this is maybe the first step and then also reaching out to the other networks could be come after. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Uh, turning to the last one, expertise. This one also got a lot of airplay during the conference. And to talk about that is Mario Lena. Uh, Van der May, and she is a, a professor as well, and she's going to tell us a, a bit about what she really resonated with her in terms of expertise. Yes, um, in the sessions, uh, there was quite a bit of attention for training people's basic traditional science communication skills, so how to write a journalistic piece or create videos. Uh, both for students as well as for scientists. Um, but apart from that, there were also quite a, a, a few sessions that were talking about uh, deconstructing the meaning of what is an expert or what is expertise. And uh, in many sessions, there was actually a sort of need addressed that, um, well, both science communication professionals as well as scientists need to learn on how to recognize and acknowledge uh, local expertise, as it's not always expressed in the same way as scientific expertise. Um, yeah, so that's basically what we saw. So in terms of looking at different forms of expertise, how can our community help facilitate that spanning the boundary, if you like, between different forms of expertise? Um, yeah, what I think is that we could learn a bit better from each other on how we actually do that. So I saw quite a few presentations during the conference and the whole team actually reported about that, um, that were saying, well, we did that in our project. We, we try to uh, go to different communities and try to acknowledge and uh, uh, recognize and acknowledge their expertise. But I think we could learn a bit more from each other in a bit more of a narrative way so that we can see, okay, how did you actually do that then? And how, how can, what can we learn from that in our own context? So by having more in-depth, contextualized, maybe narrative kind of way of talking through how you did that, we can learn a bit more from each other in our own com context. Thank you so much. I, I think um, as we bring this conference to a close and we, we listen to these reflections, it is clear to me that voice has been discussed at this conference and explored, but it's just the start. It's just the start of a journey for us to really deliberately look at these elements of what it means to create common ground. And I think that journey requires ongoing conversations. But as part of that, something that, that a few of you have emphasised is the importance of what I consider the most important science communication skill, and that is listening. So as we go forward, I would urge you all to keep listening to each other and having those conversations, some of them quite hard, as we go forward and create the, the, the ongoing community that is PCST. Please join with me in thanking our fabulous panel this afternoon.
not an easy job and they did it extremely well. One of the personal highlights for me of this conference has been the opportunity to engage with people like this that you saw on stage. Young, dynamic, confident people involved in science communication, scholarship, research and teaching. I'm very privileged and I'm very glad that you're here and I feel like the community that I leave as president is in very, very good hands. So thank you very much to everyone that's here. Okay, um, I've got announcements to make now, exciting announcements. I feel like I'm, you know, I need some, someone here to sort of, anyway, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, I, I would ask Heather to come on stage for this first one because Heather is involved in the Aberdeen Conference in 2025 and the winners of these awards get free registration at that conference. So in terms of the actual visual display or poster, the winning poster, and she told me how to pronounce her name and I'm sure I'm gonna get it wrong, is Ike Vonk for the difference in framing between ocean climate change and ocean plastic, a content analysis of press releases. Congratulations, Ike, are you here? My apologies, Ike, and congratulations. <laughs> um, the, the, the best presentation uh, was delivered by Joanna Bordello. Um, the chairs of all the three visual presentations, have, and I was one of them, have told me how fantastic those sessions were. So well done, all of you. But Joanna Bordello has won it for reaching undeserved communities through circular education and outreach programs. Joanna, are you here? Yes, congratulations. <laughs> now, I've been asked a lot in the last day or so about who's the new president. <laughs> there isn't one. <laughs> um, because it all, the president is elected by the new committee. And as yet, you don't know who the new committee is. <laughs> I do, but you don't. And, and so that committee will be meeting online sometime in the next couple of weeks and they will elect the people who will be president and so on within that committee. So that's the process. The other thing that has been brought home to me is that many of you don't know how PCST functions. We do not have a paid secretariat. The conference today has happened through volunteer activity. Marina had a little bit of help from students that was paid we have a website that is paid for, but otherwise it is really the time and effort of members of our scientific committee. So please put your hands together for those members. <laughs> and now for the news of the new members who join this volunteer crew. <laughs> And I'm going to announce them in, order, in, in um, alphabetical order in terms of their region. So the first region is Asia, Australasia. Uh, the first person who has been um, nominated and won that nomination is Siddharth Kankaria. <laughs> the second is Joan Leach. The third is Fabian Medbecky. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy to announce that Goyan Wang, who is on our committee but was up for re-election, has been re-elected. Thank you, Goyan. <laughs> From Europe, also up for re-election, Heather Doran. Secondly, Declan Fay. Declan, are you here? <laughs> Thirdly, Lars Gunter. Lars, are you here? <laughs> Lars, Lars, are you here? Oh, maybe we should just throw them out. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and the fourth one is France Van Damme. France, are you here? France? Ah, there you are. Congratulations. Um, for the under 35, um, Mohamed Daoud. And someone who is unable to make it because of her partner being ill it, from Australia is Tara Robertson. <laughs> the student that has been elected, and this is a new position on our committee after our last um, voting, it was voted that we have a student representative. So congratulations to Yu Yen Pan. And just so you know, there were four positions for the Africa Americas, um, so there was no vote. So that returns to our committee, Jamana Barata. <laughs> Jamana. <laughs> Alice Flea Rackers. <laughs> <laughs> and we have two new members, Nan Lee. <laughs> Don't know if you're here and Sandra Muriello. <laughs> of course, there were um, more than half of our committee who were, weren't up for election, and so they'll continue on. So I urge you to look at, at um, our website to see who those are. We'll try and get the full um, committee up onto the website as soon as we can. Sorry, Michelle. What? Oh, yes. I, who's, who, who's here in the committee? Come up on stage. Come on. Come on. The new committee, the existing committee, come up on stage. <laughs> come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> so if you're already on the committee, if you've been newly elected, please come up on stage. lovely to see so, so many new faces. Um, welcome to the PCST Scientific Committee leading forward into the next two years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, you can go now. <laughs> Uh, it's also my uh, honour to announce where PCST 2027 will be hosted. This was voted on through the PCST committee meeting at the start of um, this conference. And I'm hoping it's been kept fairly confidential until now. But it's my great pleasure to say that PCST 2027 will be held in Shanghai, China. I would like to invite a couple of you to come up and, and say a couple of words before I hand over to the host of PCST 2025 in Aberdeen. <laughs> um, obviously, we've, we've all made, um, reached a common ground for that decision, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, on behalf of uh, Shanghai Jiangsu University and the local organizing committee, I would like to welcome all of you to Shanghai in 2027. Yeah. <laughs> And I would really like to uh, now hand over to Heather Doran again, <laughs> um, who's been our secretary in PCST in, for the last couple of years. She tells me she's not going to be secretary anymore. So new committee, you need to find a new secretary because Heather's going to be very busy in Aberdeen 2025. How did we get to 2025? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you all um, very much. And I just wanted to say as well, um, this 
this journey to Aberdeen started back in 2016. Um, <laughs> there have been many changes since then. I have had a number of children since that point, but <laughs> there's been you know, a few, few world events and a number of things that have gone on. So we are really excited to welcome people to Aberdeen. But I want to invite up to the stage two of my colleagues from the local organising committee, uh, Dr Chris Crawley and um, Nikki Pierce. So we want to come up and we're just going to say a few words about Aberdeen. So, yeah, as, as I mentioned, the journey started in, in 2016, which was at the Istanbul conference where um, we bid um, to host the conference. It was me and my colleague, um, Ken Skeldon, who is on the local organizing committee as well. Um, while we were bidding, there was a power outage and we were asked to carry on. And I think that might have been a sign <laughs> at that point <laughs> that there might have been, um, but yeah. It's been um, a long road. We were heavily involved in, 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 um, in the virtual conference that I hope many of you attended two years ago, and um, all of the, the, the local organising committee have kept in touch and continued to work during this time. So we are incredibly excited um, to welcome people to Aberdeen in 2025. So I think that's enough about the journey that we're going on, and I'm going to hand over to Chris to say a little bit more about Aberdeen. Yes, I'm Chris. I work as the public engagement with research manager at the University of Aberdeen and also on the local organising committee. So we've been working on themes, we've been evolving the, the, the themes for the 2025 conference in Aberdeen. I realise I stand between us and the ability to leave this conference and go home and I will try and be quick but there's also nothing worse I am aware right now than a Scottish person from Glasgow at that speaking really quickly. <laughs> I could be saying anything so I shall try and moderate my pace. But we've been evolving these themes for Aberdeen in 20, PCST in Aberdeen in 2025, and it is affecting positive change in a world which is increasingly febrile and showing um, symptoms, challenges, the, the traditions of the old and the new and the disputes that are arising. It's what space can, science communication exist in to affect positive change within that wider context of these huge global change. Um, challenges that we have, health, food, water, poverty, and indeed the, the cost of living crisis as it exists in the world today. And to that end, we have Pay It Forward for 2025 as one response there as, as the local organising committee. So the opportunity there is already set up for those who can to pay it forward and generate a fund to support those who otherwise couldn't come to PCST. So that's that on the one hand. The next thing is, is why come to Aberdeen. Um, well, first of all, we have a, a very active, a small but very active public engagement with research unit, the RU for short. Um, we, we're a mixture, um, we're a diverse group, and um, we're traditionally, um, we're all researchers, um, or traditionally we have all been researchers in Peru. I, I myself am a historian, I worked as a historian for 14 years before moving into this, but today we also have a social media officer, we um, also have a conference and events specialist, so that greatly reflects what we do. And in public engagement with research, you know, we provide all the structural support for our communities, our networks, our funders, for the academics and the public groups that we work with, the stuff that you would expect at the top, but the, the activities at the bottom that I want to draw attention to, because as part of PCST in Aberdeen in 2025, we aim to put on a lot of public engagement with research activities. So hopefully we'll do um, a bright club, that's our comedy night. And this will be open to participants, to, to speakers. So this is something that will set up in the, the, the following years. Um, we also do PK, Pekka Kucha, as it's sometimes called, Pachakaka. I'll try that again, Pachakacha, um, as it's more properly known. So we'll put all of this on as part of a wider public offering as part of PCST in Aberdeen. And then the area itself, as I say, I am a historian. So Aberdeen, northeast of Scotland, but in, in, in blue there. There's Aberdeen there in this slide on the right, hemmed in by the, the rivers Don to the north and the river Dee to the south, surrounded by castles and stone circles. I was going to make the point, um, it's a fairly asinine point, it's historic. 
well, anywhere where people have lived for about 2,000, 3,000 years is historic and prehistoric. But what you've got in Aberdeen is a really distinctive culture, um, peculiar to the northeast of Scotland. So you're on the very top left-hand slide there, you've got a recumbent stone circle. There are huge numbers of stone circles indicative of prehistoric activity in the region. You can go online and read any number of things about stone circles, which will authoritatively tell you what they did. We have no idea what stone circles are really properly about. But as you emerge into history, just beneath it, that's a Pictish stone circle, uh, sorry, a, sorry, a Pictish carved stone. So the Picts are the people who sort of straddle the Bronze Age from prehistory into history in the first sort of writing. But we don't know that they were called Picts. Picts is a Roman name for them. It means painted people. And it's a bit of an insult and derogatory term for them. We don't know what they called themselves. We don't know what they looked like. Although I would suggest that they don't look like Mel Gibson. <laughs> you know, <laughs> moving into m more more recognisable history, Castle Country, the uh, Dunotter Castle on the coast, just to the south of Aberdeen, it's fantastic. Inland castles, also um, Slane's Castle, just to the north of Aberdeen. Inspiration for um, Dracula, Bram Stoker was inspired to write it there. Possibly after a dram of whiskey, possibly not, who knows, but you're in the heart of whiskey country as well. But the city of Aberdeen itself has got a distinctive look. It is granite, it is the granite city, it is the grey city. Um, so that's Marshall College there, which is in the heart of Aberdeen. The University of Aberdeen is formed by a merger of two independent colleges, um, King's College founded 1495 and then um, Marshall College 16th century. But the, that edifice, the granite edifice of, of Marshall College shows you what granite can look like when it's at its absolute best, when it's been cleaned, when the sun is shining. But Aberdeen also pulls off the trick of actually looking really good in the mist, which is lucky. <laughs> um, but you know, so do come to Aberdeen very historic, a lot of fantastic countryside round about it and a lot to explore and we hope to sort of sync with trips um, round about the countryside and to explore the history and archaeology of the place too. But also an area of inward investment. Yeah, thanks Chris. So yeah, um, Aberdeen's got a rich history but it's also a modern vibrant city and there's been a vast amount of investment in the city over the last couple of years. Um, so the main conference venue will be PNJ Live which is shown sort of in the middle um, at the right and that's a brand new venue, 330 million pound investment, and the main sessions will be there. It's a, it's a brilliant um, facility. We'll also be for the welcome, um, welcoming ceremony in the city centre, which um, in the music hall, which has also been redeveloped. That's a nine million pound investment, and again, a fabulous facility, completely different. Um, but we, you know, we want to show you what the city's got to offer. The Science Centre has been redeveloped as well. That was a six million pound investment. The art gallery has been reimagined over a five year period and reopened in 2020, I think. So an, another um, space that has won lots of awards and is a real delight to visit. Um, but it's not just buildings that have been redeveloped. There's been a lot of infrastructure changes as well. There's a brand new harbour that is just about finished, but it's already open. We've got um, investment in road infrastructure and it's made the city really easy to get around or even more easy to get around. There's been investment in the airport as well and the city is really easy to get to. And um, this video will give you a sneak peek of the city but also how easy it is to get to. Aberdeen has been an international meeting place for over 900 years when our port was established. But now there are many more ways to get here and many more reasons to try. Travelling to Aberdeen is straightforward. We are one stop from the world with daily flights from European hub cities. Several trains connect us to the rest of Scotland and the UK every hour. Our hydrogen and electric bus fleet offer sustainable road transport, giving you easy access to our modern, vibrant city and thousands of beautiful locations. So wherever you're coming from, Aberdeen is on your doorstep. For your next event, meet in Aberdeen. You've no idea how excited we are to be welcoming you to Aberdeen after 10 years of waiting for it.
so thank you everyone. As mentioned, the, um, the mailing list and website is um, ready, so please sign up to that to receive information about the next steps to join us in Aberdeen in 2025. And the Pay It Forward is open as well. That was a, a special scheme that was opened for the original 2020 conference. We knew that the science communication community is so passionate about supporting others to make sure they can attend. And we, we know how much finance can be a barrier to people. And so that's a way of people sharing that and can contribute what they can to support others to attend. So that's something that's continued. So I hope to see you all there in 2025. I think everyone's going to be leaving here with very full diaries. So that is very good about what they're going to be doing for the next, like I've pretty much spent the next, the last 10 years being planned out by PCST. So I think we've almost filled everyone's diaries now, at least till 2027. Um, but my last thing is to hand over back to um, Jenny and also to give a huge thanks to Jenny for leading um, PCST through the last two years as president. And I think I speak on behalf of all of the scientific committee when we thank Jenny for all the work that she's done, the patience that she's shown, all the hard work that's gone on and support. Um, it really is, there's emails going round, I said this yesterday, I think at the AGM, but there's emails going round 24 hours a day between people on the scientific committee and Jenny couldn't have been more welcoming and supportive and helpful with everyone who's joined. I joined as a, a, as a new member, um, I was, was in the under 35 category, not now. But, um, and doing that is intimidating. And having a president and people who have been part of the network for so long welcome people in and encourage people and support everyone to contribute to the network has just been incredible. And Jenny has led through incredible change over the past two years. So thank you so much, Jenny. I feel humbled and extremely privileged to have had that role for two years and to have been involved with the scientific committee for 30 years since I first met Bernard Schiller in Montreal. It has been an absolute and utter privilege and honour. And we couldn't do what we do without the members of our committee and without you as a community. I'm so happy that so many people have come to a final session here today. That's very unusual. Um, I would also like to ask Marina Yober to stand up because what she did in this conference is amazing. And the other person is Anna Dykstra, who also <laughs> wasn't expecting to do this. She wasn't expecting to do this and she did it, along with her colleagues who also were amazing. Where's Carolina? Carolina, bye man, where are you? Carolina in particular. There, please stand up. And Heather, Secretary, making us all make sure we do our reports and do things properly. Thank you so much. And lastly, thank you. Yeah, and I... So now it's time to say a final word of thanks. I've been thanking people and the sponsors and partners and other people already a few times. Now it's um, a different thank you. But first I would like, uh, I wanted to say some failures of the conference, but I was advised not to do that. So <laughs> I will uh, give a, three successes. So I think a success is that the variety of participants, the country, the content is a success of why everyone is so um, positive, at least towards me, about the conference. So I'm really glad about that. I think it's, it's also the will, uh, the, 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 yeah, the will to look for common ground in each other, like to, to listen, for example. And it's also you, all the participants who made that possible, because without you, we could not have done that. <laughs> I 
I also have three tips because it was for me, um, well, unexpected and it was a steep learning curve also to what the PCC scientific committee uh, wants from uh, the local organizing committee. So, um, and I think it's also good to know that we were with a big group of local organizing committees, so a big group of people in the local organizing committee. So there were many people who had ideas and often they were good and they had good ideas and they can help you also. Even if I sometimes thought that I and Caroline and uh, Fred had to do it more or less on our own. Um, Maybe another tip is that I consider everything as a project, and this was also a project. So sometimes that was reassuring. Projects end, and they go, <laughs> continue. So that's good. And it's also good to be a little bit reflective and a little bit see that you still can laugh at yourself or laugh with yourself. So that's good as well. That's where the three tips. So. I had a slide on, uh, on the screens all the time with all the members I tried, all, all the persons I tried to uh, uh, thank. So I will go very quickly through them because I see it's two minutes before it's 15 past. Um, so this was the pre-conference student team. Thanks a lot and the guidance of <laughs> Lisbeth de Bakker. One thing we could do is also ask students from all the different universities to help. So we had students from one or two from each university. And this, this is the whole team. And they were guided by uh, Leonie de Klaus. <laughs> then we had, of course, the local organizing committee. On the right, you see all the members. And on the left, all the... Uh, the committee uh, chairs, so to say, and the co-chairs of the, uh, the conference, uh, the local organizing committee, were uh, Laurens Landeweert and Caroline Weerman. <laughs> so a big thank you as well. Oh, and I think I, we should also thank uh, Mario Leine, who uh, organized the art uh, work together with Fred, who did a lot in the sponsoring as well. So uh, that from Frank, who uh, coordinated the publicity for the conference because where I was supposed to be part of that team and do that little task or contribute to that little task, but uh, Frank, uh, uh, Marike Baan, and Barry, who was on the the, the sign uh, were there, and we had help of Carolina, a student from the University of Twente as well. <laughs> and of course, the Congress Bureau, they helped us mainly here, but also organizing everything beforehand regarding the catering and the logistics, etc. They're not here, but thanks a lot. I want to thank, not myself, but um, <laughs> say something about how we did it. Be, so when um, yeah, we had to, to, to take action to make sure that it would happen, uh, we decided that Fred, Carolina, and me would meet every Monday morning really early online, as well as I would meet with Jenny thereafter or before online. So we could coordinate and make sure that we, well, we could understand what was going on. So that was a big help. Thanks uh, for them, Carolina and Fred. And I would like to thank the PCST Scientific Committee. Yeah, we met before the conference. We saw this is the old, this is the old committee. And I would specifically thank two people. And for you, I have a present. So. Yeah, we had something for all the, the keynote speakers. Yeah. Um, and then there's a personal thanks, because I think my I had to do this next to my projects, which I could not postpone. 
anymore, but I would like to thank the project that I'm in, the par project partners, because they were very understandable that I could not work so much on my deadlines. And specifically, I had some help from the University of Twente because I applied for funding, research funding, but I was allowed to use it not for research funding, but for the two students uh, that helped me out. Um, Carolina, I mentioned her already, and Lena, she's there uh, in front. And then also, <laughs> Sikke and Anouk, my colleagues, they really helped a lot or supported me. Uh, um, what's the word for it? Um, Mentally, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where I'm going to tonight, and then I'm going to... <laughs> so thanks a lot. Have a safe uh, journey home. I would like to ask the local organizing committee members to maybe meet at the registration desk to have a final word to you and give you something. And uh, I would like to uh, w wish everyone a good travels home. Thank you so much.